We're going to be in the book of Judges. We're in a sermon series. Coulda, shoulda, but didn't. And last Sunday, we got introduced to a guy by the name of Micah. And this guy, he's from the tribe of Ephraim. And Micah, the name means, who is like Yahweh? Who is like God? And so the backstory that we kind of looked at last week, which leads kind of right into this week, Micah, he stole some money from his mom. And upon being severely cursed, Micah, he returns the money to his mom, and his mom ends up making two idols, a graven idol and a, a molten uh, idol. And so along the way, Micah, he comes in contact. Actually, a priest, a young priest, comes right to his doorstep. And we're going to hear a little bit more about this young uh, Levite, this young priest. Uh, and, and so this guy, we end up finding out towards the end of this chapter, we won't really cover much of it today, but kind of dot, 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 down the road. Uh, he is supposedly the grandson of Moses. And his name is Jonathan. And so that, yes. FYI, that is not where I got my name from. When my parents were going through the Bible, I was a friend of God. I was David's friend. Uh, that was Jonathan. That was where my parents based my name off of. I did double check. Uh, it is not this Jonathan. So, but as Judges, you see it last week, we looked at it. Judges 17, 6. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's really kind of a bookend, because at the very end, the last verse in all of this book, it says pretty much the identical thing. And just as it says all of this, Micah chooses to do just that. And he ends up creating his own religion, which is man's attempt to kind of gain favor from God. Uh, and this puts this young Levite, and he ends up uh, putting this young Levite as the high priest over this kind of fake religion that he is attempting to do. And as he stands back at the end of chapter 17, Micah stands back and he looks at all that he was able to do, all that he was involved in, all that his mom kind of helped him to facilitate, and Micah is well pleased. And he actually believes genuinely that everything that he has done, God will also not only bless, but he's encouraged by it all. And so he's off base. But that brings us up to today's main text, Judges 18, 1 through 13. So we're going to look at kind of the first part of this chapter 18 today. Again, it opens up, and we're going to talk briefly about this, uh, it opens up with this idea of the historic time frame that all of this is happening where Israel is without a king. Uh, there is no king over all of Israel. Israel is under, at this point, what is known as a theocracy. And all that means is a God-governed, God-ruled type government. And so that's what's happening. It is a God-led government. It's not a monarchy. There's not just one person or a king over it. It is God that is leading this. And this was the time where Israel had recently, they had just been sent out to drive out the inhabitants of the Promised Land. This section from 17 all the way to the end, it really, time frame, it fits right at the beginning between the end of Joshua where he passes away, and before Othniel, the first judge that we have already previously covered. But if you remember, and we're going to kind of circle back on this just a little bit, but the tribe of Dan, there are 12 tribes, there are 12 tribes in the nation of Israel, and one of those tribes is Dan. And this tribe was the only one, if you remember when we walked through, this was the only one that didn't really do any of the driving out. They were actually so poor at it that they were thrust up into the hill country. And they were kind of living in caves because they didn't do what God commanded them to do. And a large thrust of this passage, it builds off of that idea. And so what's happening right now is the tribe of man, they are going to be going, on out, going out somewhere else to try to get territory. So they're not going to be the hill people. They're going to be able to get right up and somewhere else, even though it's not where God commanded 
And it's not what God has already provided for them. So today's message, it is entitled, The Sons of Dan Seek Territory. But before we look into it any further, let's just go to the Lord and ask uh, for wisdom as we break this all apart. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for books like this, Lord. It does give us historical content, but Lord, it's so much more than a history book. Lord, this is so vibrant. Lord, the situations that go on, Lord, there's parallels, there's things, Lord, that we, in, a, in what we're facing, Lord, we can connect the dots. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, as we look at this, Lord, it is more of a commentary, not on the historical side of things. It mentions it, but it's really a commentary on the heart. Lord, there is a heart that is wayward. Lord, there is a heart in all of Israel, Lord, that is just kind of wandered away from you at this point. But Lord, I'm reminded, Lord, even as I share that, Lord, even as I am praying to you, I thank you, Lord, for the book that happens parallel to this one. Lord, the book of Ruth. <laughs> Lord, that is happening exactly at the same historical time frame as this book of Judges. And so, God, I thank you that even in our worst moments as human history, Lord, there are pockets where people have been focused on you from the very beginning. Lord, when the whole world was going to be flooded, Lord, there was no one. Lord, and that he desired to follow you, Lord. All throughout history, that has been the two. And we can look to you, Lord. It's not because of anything we've done. It's not because of us. It's because of the God we serve and look to and follow. And so, God, I pray as we look at this text today, Lord, that you would enlighten us and that you would challenge us by you. And that we would be more Christ-like, Lord, that we would lean more upon you because we desperately need you. And we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So it starts right off in verse 1 of Judges 18. And it says, In those days there was no king of Israel. And in those days the tribe of the Danites, the tribe of Dan, was seeking an inheritance for themselves to live in. For until that day, an inheritance had not been allotted to them as a possession among the tribes of Israel. So in those days, what that is referring to is, again, that time between Joshua and the first judge, Othniel. And at this point in history, and actually we see it all throughout all of the judges, there is immorality that is revealed in these remaining chapters, and it's just, it's on display from the beginning of Judges all the way through the end. But that's kind of how it all summarizes at the end. In those days there was no king, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It was kind of this absolute relativism. It's really, whatever feels good, do it. But there's no moral absolutes. And they're living in that time. And unfortunately, this immorality that you see all throughout this book, it is widespread and it is prevalent all throughout the 12 tribes. And instead of locking their eyes on their God and following him, instead of keeping their focus on the one that has taken care of them all in the past and has promised to do so all the way until he sends his Messiah and until he returns, instead of all of that, Israel had a wandering eye. And they looked to other nations, and they started to cross-compare. They're like, eh, they don't have it that bad. And they looked to other kings, and they're like, you know what? We really need a king for ourselves. And that's what they thought was going to be their remedy to what they're living in. And it says, while there was no king in Israel, and that whole idea, there was no king in Israel, that is a factual statement at this point. There was no king. But it was also this idea of a longing. It was this statement that, oh man, I just wish we had one. Because if we had a king, boy, all of our problems would just be solved. We could look to that one person, and that would take care of everything. It kind of felt like less, because they didn't have a king. And although they didn't have a king, I do want to make this point. They had their God. 
the one who had chosen them, the one back with Abraham that said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. This is the fulfillment of that great nation. And it is all promised. And instead of keeping their eyes on their God, their God sadly wasn't enough for them. They wanted something else. And to be very honest with you, sometimes if we're not careful, we can live lives that echo similar wandering hearts. And it's not only in this chapter, but in a lot of the other Old Testament passages that we see. Again, as I said, the backdrop to a lot of this, uh, if you get your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter 1. Uh, I want you to see Judges chapter 1, 34. Basically what's happened here is the Amorites, they had forced the tribe of Dan to go live in the hill country. If you remember, God had told all the 12 tribes, this land is your land. This land is my land. And so you need to go on out, and this land that I have already given to you, you just need to go out and finish the job. And so when it gets to Dan, this is what it says in 34 of chapter 1. Then the Amorites forced the sons of Dan into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down the valley. Basically, things were too difficult, and Dan fled. Dan didn't want to do what God commanded because it looked scary. It didn't really seem to be an easy task. And maybe the Amorites were really tough, and so they kind of fled and left. Again, God had a lot of territory for each tribe. But it was each tribe's responsibility to go out and finish the job. Dan, that tribe, did not do that. Instead, at this moment, now that we've kind of gone through everything historically, we're going to bring it back to this. Now, Dan is going to go on out and try to find another place to call home. One that God did not give him. That's always a problem. So, verse 2. So the sons of Dan sent from their family five men out from their whole number, valiant men from Zorah and Ashtola, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said to them, Go search the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. Now, it says right at the beginning of this, it uses the word family. And that can either mean a tribe or a people nation. And so that's what it's referring to. So the tribe of Dan, they end up selecting five men who possess strength, who are valiant, and they go on off, and they are going to spy out. That's their goal. And this word spy out, it means that they are going to walk along, they're going to basically explore. They're going to look to see what is in this land. They're basically your, um, the, the people who go ahead. <laughs> they're your scouts. And that's what's kind of happening here. And these five men, they're sent out on a mission to investigate this land. And eventually, these five men, they end up landing up in uh, Ephraim, the hill country of Ephraim, and they land at the house of Micah. And they're going to lodge there. That's what this text says. In verse 3, when they were near the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young man, the Levite. And they turned aside there and said to him, Who brought you here? And what are you doing in this place? And what do you have here? As these five men, as they got close to the house of Micah, they recognized a voice. And the word recognize, they acknowledge, they understood it could actually mean that they had a previous acquaintance with this voice uh, sometime in the past, or simply they just understood this voice, they respected this voice. But something, it seemed a little out of place. This young Levite that they heard the voice, it was like, hmm, this is peculiar. What are you doing here? What are you what? And so they're asking things. And they hear the voice of the young Levite, and these five men, they inquire as to why this Levite is in the house of Micah. And the line of questions that these five men start asking, it actually indicates a sense of surprise. It's like they're like, whoa, 
almost dumbfounded to find this young Levite in this situation in Ephraim at this house. It seems like whatever they're experiencing, what they're hearing, what they're seeing, it is something that seemed very peculiar, something out of place. Verses 4 through 6. He said to them, Thus and so has Micah done to me, and he has hired me, and I have become his priest. They said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether our way on which we are going will be prosperous. The priest said to them, Go in peace. Your way in which you are going has the Lord's approval. The young Levite, he responded, and basically, these five men, they come on up to him, and they are trying to figure this all out, and they land at Micah's door, and upon hearing that this guy was a priest, and that Micah had hired him, and basically, if you remember, he hired him for a yearly wage of about ten pieces of silver, he hired him with food and clothing and uh, drink, he was going to take care of all of his needs. So this young Levite, he was going to be Micah's personal priest. As they hear all of this account, I have to tell you, red flags should have been going off in their minds. They're already thinking this is peculiar. This guy, why is he here? This seems strange. They should have been going off in these five, minds, uh, these five men's minds. What they saw and what they heard was contradictory to God's plan. And instead of rebuking this young Levite and clear and all of this idolatry that they're kind of seeing and starting to have unfold in front of them, these men picture this. Instead of rebuking it like they should have done, these men ask this young Levite for godly wisdom. That is bizarro, world folks. This does not make any sense. They should not have been asking this Levite for, so, help us, pray for us, let us know if what we're about to do is God's will. No, because this guy is so far outside of what God's will is, how are you expecting him to discern anything? That's just crazy thoughts. It's sad. But this level of corruption and this level of depravity, at this time, this whole nation is overrun with. It's not just in small little pockets. It is widespread through all of Israel. I want you to listen to what Charles Ryrie says about all of this. He puts it in some really good terms. He says, Unable to possess their allotment of land, the Danites sought God's blessing on their search for other territory. The priests told them what they wanted to hear. Though outwardly successful, and we're going to eventually get to see that, the Danites had abandoned God's revealed will, which resulted in Dan becoming a major center of idolatry. FYI, this is not going to end well. And it's these small steps, and it's actually now getting to be very large steps. They're going to reveal all of this. Now, I want to give you a word of caution. Just because someone agrees with you, it doesn't mean that the two of you are right. Okay? Just because someone, if you're on Facebook and someone gives you a thumbs up or they love it, it doesn't mean what you're saying is factually correct. It doesn't mean that it is grounded on Scripture, which is our authority. <coughs> you can get a lot of likes and say a lot of things that are way wrong. So just so you say something, it doesn't mean that that's actually the best counsel. If I'm talking to someone and because it tickles my ears, it doesn't mean what they're sharing with me is good. It doesn't mean that that is right. Our lives, they need to be guided. They need to be directed by God's unfailing, His unchanging, His authoritative word, the Scriptures. That's the source, and that's the only source of absolute truth. This is the bedrock to what we believe as Christians, as people who have placed their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. It's all found here. Personal opinions, maybe you've already experienced in this life, but they are often apt to change. Let me give you an example of this. 
Growing up as a little itty bitty, I hated everything to do with onions. I didn't like them at all. Even the sight of them made me go, but dare I say, now that I am a cook in my own home, if I dice them up real small or they're hidden in like a blooming onion, I will eat onions. So there's some progress. And so that's kind of some weak attempt of kind of explaining this. But let me just tell you, you know, it's got to be right here. And our opinions, they fluctuate. They're not the basis for anything. Each of us, we need to purpose in our hearts to allow God's word to be that final authority in our lives. Now, we're going to go back to the Bible. And every time we do that, every time you hear an opinion, every time you personally are reading something and you're thinking through something on your own, we need to go back to the Bible and we need to see what God's word says on any particular matter. Search it out for yourself. No one. So, back to our text. Verse 7. Then the five men departed and came to Laish, and saw the people who were in it living in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. For there was no ruler humiliating them for anything in the land. And they were far, and they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. After these five men left, they came to a place called Laish. And what they did, as they were told to do, they went out and they scouted the land. They observed. They probably had a little notepad. They were just going to kind of write down a little oh, bullet point. This land is beautiful. This land is comfortable. Oh, I see the people around us. And they seem to just kind of be secure. And so they're kind of, you've got to get some of their bullet point notes of what they're observing. They're, they're counting their number. They're, they're trying to see how strong they are. They want to see how this group of people is living. To kind of put it in parallel, if ever you've been to a mall and you've sat on a bench and you start people watching, that's to some extent what this group of people do. They're, they're people watching. Except they're just kind of walking through. What they discovered is this group of people, they live with a sense of security. They seem to not need to fear any attacks. And John Gill, as he's recounting all of the, what this is going on in the Laish, this is what John Gill, a commentator, he ends up saying. Their carelessness and confidence might arise from their strong fortresses, or rather because they thought their city and the land adjacent to it did not belong to the land of Israel and did not know that the Israelites made any pretensions to it and therefore were quite easy and in no fear of them, had no watchmen to guard their city and did not take care to furnish themselves with weapons of war for their defense. Like the Sidonians, who like them lived in a strong fortified city and were in no fear of the Israelites, because their city was not in the land of Canaan. I'm going to say that again. <coughs> this land that they're off with, it's not in the land of Canaan. That should also be raising red flags with everyone. It only bordered and touched it. It seemed, again, like this location of Laish, it led them to this place of uh, a sense of security at least from the Israelites, they weren't really afraid because this really wasn't their territory. Verses 8, and, uh, eight through 10. When they came back to their brothers at Zorah and Ashtola, the, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is good. And will you sit still? Do not delay to go to enter to possess the land. When you enter, you will come to a secure people with a spacious land. For God has given it into your hand, a place where there is no lack of anything that is on earth. So upon observing all the things about this land and the people who are inside it, these five men, they return back to their tribe mates and they end up telling them all the things that they discovered. 
Try to Dan. While they're waiting eager for these men, they're like, okay, what did you find? And these five guys, this is what they report. Right now, get ready. We're going to go on off. We're going to do battle. Because what we saw in this land, it is a land that is rich. It is a land that is fertile. It seems like this land is a place to easily conquest. These people are secure. And again, that idea, the word secure, it means to feel safe, to be careless. The inhabitants of the land, they were honestly easy pickings. It says, for God has given it into your hands. That statement, that is based on what the young Levite had told them. That's what that is connected back to. And the reality, the area that was given to them, it was currently being possessed and uh, taken over by the Amorites, which they felt were too scary to actually encounter in battle. So instead of doing what God commanded, which probably looks scary and maybe even a little overwhelming, they try to do things in their own way. You know, as I read that, I am so glad I don't identify with any of them, ever. It's true. If we're not careful, that could be our story. We need to be clean of that if we got this. Again, the question is often, will I follow what I know? That's what it comes down to oftentimes. Will I follow God and what I know about Him? Will I follow Him? 11 and 13. Then from the family of the Danites, from Zorah and from Ashtol, 600 men armed with weapons of war set out. They went up and camped at Kariath Judah and Judah. Therefore, they called that place Mahanadam to this day. Behold, it is in the west of Kariath Jerah. They passed from there to the hill country of Ephraim, and came to the house of Micah. So here in this report, 600 armed men, they leave ready for war. They're ready for battle. And the first stop that they go is this place that is renamed Mahadani. Okay? And what that means, this is going to speak to how creative this group of people are. It means camp of Dan. They're very creative. Camp of Dan. So, from that pit stop, from that place, these 600 armed men, they eventually come upon the house of Micah. The one of that, that young priest. And next Sunday, we're going to talk about this whole encounter and what actually takes place when they cross paths with this young priest. And the second time. And this is what we're going to kind of see next week. But let's wrap up all of this. So I didn't want to go too much and kind of overwhelm you with it because this has a lot of meat in and of itself. So this passage, I personally believe that there is a similarity between this passage and what you see in Numbers, where the 12 tribe or the 12 uh, spies that are sent out into the promised land and they're going there to kind of see what that land is really like on the inside. And you'll see all of this in Numbers chapter 13. But God, he commands Moses to send out 12 spies to scout out this promised land before Israel actually goes in and starts to conquer it. And all 12 spies, they come back with reports of how wonderful and how fruitful and how absolutely this place is flowing with milk and honey. This promised land is everything God told us it was going to be. It is outstanding. Beautiful. Probably reminds us of how we're traveling into our church today. But ten spies, they come back and they see how things, not only do they see how the land is amazing, but they are stumbling over the fact that there is so many giants in this land. And that this land has fortified cities. Then there were the two. Uh, Joshua and Caleb. And those two, they see that. It's not that they didn't see the giants. It's not that they didn't see the fortified cities. They see everything. They saw everything the other ten did. But they thought, all of that stuff, that's not too difficult for our God. God led us here. God's going to provide. 
And they trusted God. Simply at that. The people of Israel, they ultimately side with the ten spies, and they are sent off, sadly, into the wilderness to wander for 40 years because that was not what God wanted them to do. That was the bad decision. So I want to give you some similarities. Okay? This tribe of Dan, they was already given land. Do we have a map that we can show up here? Um, we're just going to pause for tiny little seconds. But as I kind of do in this, the tribe of Dan, they're in the kind of southeast or west, southwest part by the Dead Sea. And we're going to see that in just a second. But instead of doing that where God has given them land to inhabit, they end up, it's going to be over here, instead of that, they travel roughly 125 miles to this new territory up here. So, right here is where Dan is. You can see it, it's this green one. And so they travel all the way up here. And this is going to be where they're ended up trying to go. It's crazy talk. And so that's where they're kind of migrating up towards. And so they come back. And they've got this overflowing confidence as they arrive. And they're like, this group of people up here, they are easy pickings. They are weak, they're vulnerable, and they don't suspect us coming. Prepare for battle. We are going to take this. Here's the difference. Okay? I'll give you some similarities. Here's some difference. Joshua and Caleb, they recognized that the land was fruitful and that God would provide the victory. The ten other spies, they recognized that the land is fruitful, but they only saw the big giants. They saw the strongholds that were going to get in the way. The five Danite spies, they got a blessing from a young Levite who was acting as a priest who really wasn't a priest. He was doing things outside of how God commanded things to be done. And you know what's really interesting about all of this? is this passage, it doesn't tell us anything about the process of how this young Levite blessed them. It doesn't give you any indicator of any of that. Actually, the lack of information on that, it actually leads you to a place that this is almost done on a whim. Like, yeah, okay, now that you've come to me, um, it's almost like he didn't even pray. Like, oh, this is just my feeling. Bad, bad, bad. Flags all on the play. Again, these five day night spies, they go into the land and they recognize how fruitful it is. And then they look back to their own strength. And it's like, yeah, we're strong enough. We can do this. And oh yeah, oh yeah, we got God's blessing. Because this. And it's like they're making it all up as they go. Here's the trouble. When we move off, even if it's just slightly, from the unchanging word of God, what God has clearly said, when we are doing that, we are then susceptible to end up in places that we don't know, we don't recognize, and we don't follow God. It is often a subtle thing at first, and sometimes it just doesn't look right, but we have to trust the source anyways. And if we're not, we're going to be just kind of swept away. It's so easy to go down these paths. Again, begin with the word of God. Begin with that truth. It is the ultimate authority. Again, in those days, there was no king in Israel. There may not have been a physical human at this point that was a king sitting on a throne but their God, he was sitting on the throne. Their God, he was and he is the ruler of all things that he has created. Their God ultimately would send his son, Jesus, who as the scripture reveals, as the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecy. He is the Messiah. There is no earthly king that can compare to who Jesus is. Every last attempt, even the best one that the scripture ever points out is David. 
as we saw in, in our Sunday school today, he failed multiple times. And the times that he failed, it's because his eyes weren't on who God is. But there's no earthly king that can compare to who Jesus is. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus, he is perfect and completely pure. He's holy. There is no earthly king who could have done what Jesus did. Jesus, he laid his life down as a substitute. And thus offering all of us. Everyone in this whole world, a restored relationship. That what is revealed of our sin, he restores it all. He brings it back into right because of what he's done and who he is. How sad, in the tribe of Dan, they wanted to seek something other than what God had given to them. Instead of just trusting on God and relying on God and looking to God's promise and what he's promised them, instead of doing all of that and looking to God and his provision, this tribe of Dan can take matters into their own hands. And we're going to see next week some of the compromises, some of the justifications, and just how this is all going off the rails and very much devolving. And it's doing it all along the way. Again, begin with the truth of God's word as the ultimate authority and follow God's lead. It is always, always, always best. Let's go to the word. Holy Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for your word. Lord, it is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I thank you that the God who created all things, Lord, that that is the God that this group of people was supposed to be serving, Lord, that you had selected them, Lord, that this was your chosen nation. Lord, from the very beginning when you set them apart, they were to be a display nation for you. When all of these other nations around them saw Israel, they were supposed supposed to see a reflection of their God. God, as I read this, Lord, as I've read through this book, and I know how it ends, Lord, this book of Judges is abysmal. Because, Lord, they were not looking to you. It is so hard to be a proper reflection of something we're not going to. Lord, so I pray right now for us, that you stir in our hearts. Lord, let it work in us. Lord, my prayer is for revival to sweep, that people would come to know you as Savior. Lord, that's what we look forward to, Lord. That's why there is hope. But Lord, I... I gotta be honest with you. There are things that you want to do in my life. But do not stop working. Stoke a fire in my heart, Lord. I need you. I need you every moment of every day. The frustrations that I feel, the difficulties of trying to be a husband trying to be a dad, trying to be a pastor, but I can't do it on my own. I need you. Lord, I don't just need you to start the day off for me. <laughs> I need you every waking moment. Lord, this relationship with you, that's what that matters. Lord, it's not just our future hope. There is a spot. Anyone who has called upon your name, where there is a spot reserved in heaven for that individual. But Lord, it is so beyond that. But right now, we have a Savior who in all ways like us, Lord, you know our struggles. Lord, you know the difficulties that we face. But it says in Scripture, there was no sin. Lord, there is hope in you. And you alone <laughs> for what we can't do, Lord, you did. And so, God, I come before you today, and again I ask, work in me. 
Work in our church. Lord, may you be the center of this place. And may us as a family look to you. Centered, grounded, and founded upon you alone. And may you use us as you see fit. Lord, we will give you the praise that is only due to you.